Greetings, welcome to Learn to Burn Studios. My name is Eric Stevenson. In today's video, we're gonna talk about how to burn out ceramic shell. As you've seen in a lot of videos on YouTube, when it comes to the burnout, they really kind of just skate over the process and don't really show you much. They, you know, they, they you know, they have the, you have the simplicity that you have a kiln, the wax falls out, it's gonna drain out the bottom side of the kiln and you're gonna recapture that wax to use at a later time. You're gonna bring the shell up to the temperature it's gonna make it hard. It's all pretty straightforward and simple and everything, but there's a lot of little fine details that will allow us to get the best castings um, from our shells. You know, ideally we don't want our shells to crack. Yes, we can patch them, but the, you know, those cracks will potentially show up as flashing on the metal and that's just additional cleanup or, or areas that might obscure your detail. So we want to try to, you know, not have our shells crack. Uh, we want to drop, you know, drop, and the cracking could happen, and you know, for a couple different reasons: either the wax expanding, um, and or the um, shells being too close, too tightly packed in the, into the kiln. Um, a lot of times, if if you have two two shells leaning right up against each other, and the kiln's not completely at temperature, you know, that will actually create a cold spot. And the shell won't, you know, the, the shell itself is inert. It's not expanding, but the wax is. And if that's a cold spot, the wax isn't going to, you know, melt in an efficient way where it's packed up against another shell. Anyway, you're going to wind up with a cold spot, and it's going to result as more than likely as a crack um, or an imperfection on that side of your shell. So what I've found is, you know, that the instinct is to, you know, you have a kiln. Stuff it full of, you know, if you have, you know, six shells to burn out, you, you throw all six into the, into the kiln and light it up. And realistically, you put that much shell in, regardless of the size of your kiln, your kiln's going to turn into a car fire. You're, you're pumping fuel into the burnout kiln with, you know, natural gas or propane um, or fuel or wh whatever you're driving, your, whatever's driving your burners. But realistically, the wax that's melting out, as it melts out, is actually also becoming a fuel. It, it, it winds up just, you know, you'll be pushing flame out of every orifice of the kiln, you know, around the seals or out the flue, you know, all, everything and stuff. So you really want to, what I've found is to eliminate, you know, that. I've designed my kiln actually to be a little bit smaller because I'm going to burn out my shells one at a time. And you might think that's, you know, a little bit less efficient, but in this situation, or in my situation, in the way I prefer to do it, is that once I get up and up and running, it takes me about you know 10 minutes or so to burn out a shell. And really what I'm trying to do on this first step is to burn them out, drop the wax, and then as soon as the wax is out and I have the, the majority of the carbon off of the shells, bringing them up to about you know 1500 degrees or so, then I'll pull them out, swap it into another shell, and I'll continue that cycle. And if they vitrify, great. But if they don't vitrify, I'll do my vitrification when I do my preheat uh, before the actual pour. Today we're going to talk about the main way of getting the wax out of the investment. But really, your kiln needs to be just basically anything that will hold heat. It doesn't matter what your refractory is, whether you're using a wool blanket, soft brick, hard brick, an electric kiln. Actually, de-waxing an electric kiln is problematic because it totally trashes your elements. So if you can do it with a, a gas situation, um, that's ideal. And again, if you don't have, if gas isn't an option and you're, we'll talk about other options in, a, in, the, in the upcoming videos. But for today, I wanna to try to stay on track and keep focused on talking about, you know, in this, particular, in this case, um, a gas fired or specifically a propane fired uh, burnout kiln. Now, um, as we move around the kiln here, it's, um, like I said, it's essentially just a, a tube. The bottom is um, a conical shape, uh, cat, you know, done in castable uh, with a hole in the center. So as my wax drains out, it goes, it, everything's balanced on a steel grate. As the wax melts out, it'll, you know, hit that funnel, go into the center of the kiln and then drop out through the bottom. And then it hits a chunk of angle iron that will direct it away from the kiln and uh, deposited in um, aluminum cake pans um, 
and basically make big uh, billets of wax that I can later break up and, and uh, uh, filter and reuse um, in the wax room. Um, some kilns you'll see where people will drop their wax directly into water. And that's certainly a, a, a viable way of doing it. It, it winds up adding a couple of extra steps to clean up your wax um, at, before you can use it back in the, um, you have basically have to boil out all that water that you know gets trapped up inside the, the wax. But usually what happens is that you're dropping your wax straight out and you know, depending on how many shells you're trying to burn out or how many shell, you know, whether it's all at one time or in succession, how many shells you're gonna do, you're gonna be basically throwing a ton of heat out the bottom of the kiln towards that water. And at a certain point, that water is going to heat up and actually pretty quickly. So as you're dropping the wax, it's floating on the water, but it's not actually cooling it down, which is some of the idea. It's like, oh, and as the wax drape drains out, it hits the water and in theory starts, it's going to cool down and some of that. So you're not generating a wax fire. What well, actually doesn't take that much energy or that much time before you know, everything starts saturating, you know, that wax that's, you know, flaming as it's coming out the bottom of the kiln, dripping into the water, and in this case, ultimately hot water. So in inevitably, if you burn out long enough, you're going to wind up with a wax fire on the bottom side of your kiln. So that's why on my kiln, it's well that I've opted just to go ahead and eliminate that situation, have a channel, um, in this case, a chunk of angle iron, that will actually draw the, you know, the wax away from that heat source, i.e. the bottom of the kiln and then I can collect it um, in another container. And so I have the burner coming in right at the base of the kiln in such a way that that flame is actually gonna be hitting the cup first. And again, I wanna get the cup out and the gating first. And so it, it evacuates that. And as the heat saturates into the volume of the kiln, it'll permeate the shell and then drop the pattern wax out. You know, our goal is that we wanna be able to reflect as much heat onto that shell as possible. And so depending on the construction of your kiln, will determine, you know, how you're actually going to fire it. So, you know, with the K-Wool, the nice thing about K-Wool is that it reflects heat instantly. You know, as soon as you throw heat against it, it's bouncing off. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't retain heat. You know, it doesn't, doesn't, you know, soak up any of that heat. Of course, the downside is as soon as you turn the burner off, the, the K-Wool kiln starts cooling off and you start losing that temperature in your, in your kiln. So if you're flopping your, if you're shifting uh, shells in and out of your kiln, you have to do it fairly quickly because as you every time you open the door, you're going to you know drop 500 degrees of your kiln. Other kilns, it's like going you can get away with soft brick, will absorb a certain amount of that energy, and but still you know act as a, a heat sink and ref, be able to reflect back. And then of course hard brick will absorb even more of that energy, but it'll take longer to preheat. And so if you're doing a hard brick kiln or or a castable kiln of some sort then you're gonna to wanna to bring up your kiln chamber up to at least about 1400 degrees, which is kind of a, a bright orange color. 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and I can't remember off the top of my head what that is Celsius, but it'll be here on the screen. And so, but you wanna bring it up to a nice bright orange color. And as a little tidbit and stuff like that, it's real handy to, you know, as you're looking into the kilns and whether it's your furnace, whether it's your kilns, ceramics, burnout, whatever, and stuff like that, you know, whether you're use, utilizing cones from ceramic and cones are a, a way to um, determine temperatures inside a, a kiln chamber. Um, but ultimately a parameter is, is a nice handy way to do it. But anyway, but my point is, is that every color that we see actually corresponds directly to um, a temperature range. And, 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 with, and fairly precisely and stuff. So it's real handy. If, it's great if you have a parameter or if you have cones, but if you don't have those things, a lot of these things you can actually do by eye if you learn the sequencings of colors to the, um, to the temperatures. And again, I'll um, uh, put a graph here that kind of give that kind of general indication of going from uh, dull reds to oranges into yellows into whites and, and whites being super hot and dull reds being only right about 1,000, 1,100 degrees. 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit is really where you start seeing color um, in the chamber, more than just, and, and I'm not talking about color from, from, from the burner itself, but the, you know, the actual ambient uh, heated temperature of, the, of your kiln environment. Why am I talking about you know, heat saturation and temperature and everything? Because you know, my chamber is small enough and I have the you know, correct size burner for it. I can set, set a shell in there pretty much kind of without preheating it. Although I, I do, I, I typically do preheat my kiln. 
just to help the, you know to get some heat, retained heat in that castable ring at the bottom that I talked about. But I can get away with at times if it's just a cable uh, tube to jam a burner in there, stick the, or stick the shell in, throw the burner on, and it's going to reflect heat fast enough to saturate the shell and drop the wax out. If you're in a soft brick kiln or much less a hard brick kiln and stuff like that, you really need to preheat your kiln up to it, you know, up to that, you know, uh, dull orangey color, or actually a bright orangey color. Um, like I said, about 1,400 degrees or so. And so, and, and the reason for this is as we put the, the mold into that chamber, we want the heat to equally saturate all surfaces of our shell. And that's gonna in, instantly liquefy that, the, the, all the wax that's on the, contacting the surface of that interior shell. And then, as the wax starts expanding, it's actually gonna act like a hydraulic, you know, create a hydraulic nature to it. And as it expands, it's actually gonna push that liquid barrier that's already between the wax and the shell, and it's gonna flush it out of the mold to help actually push the wax out. And so it's not more than just the wax just slowly melting out and draining, you know, from the cup through the gates and through the, you know, through the pattern. You know, we really want to, you know, we want to get the wax out of there as quickly as possible, and we can take advantage of this hydraulic nature, this, this effect that's going to happen, as long as we're putting our shells into a hot kiln chamber, again, that's going to fully saturate, you know, the, the, the shell in its entirety and push, you know, and um, the, the li get that initial liqui li liquefaction of the wax. I don't know, does that make sense? I'm trying to think if this, I'm actually explaining that right, but, um, but, but that is the premise of it all. And again, it's some people, what they'll do is they'll actually stick it into a, a, even a 2,000 degree kiln on a pair of tongs, stick it into the kiln for you know, 30 seconds or so, get that initial flash, that liquefaction on that surface, pull it out, and then stick it into a 300 degree kiln to help drop the wax out. Um, but that's neither here nor there because that's not what I'm doing. So. Um, now the one you know, side effect of, of when I burn my, you know, burning out in this way because I have such a hot chamber, um, I, I, I am vaporizing a, a certain amount of my wax, so I am not reclaiming 100% of my wax. Um, depending on the overall temperature of the kiln, so my first couple of burnouts, the kiln's a little bit cooler and I'm retaining more of my wax. As if I'm doing say 12 or 20 shells in a row, then as my kiln gets hotter, I, I actually start vaporizing more and more wax. But that's the, the, you know, the price I pay you know, in knowing that you know, ultimately, again, my goal is to get the best casting. And if I need to sacrifice some materials in my process to make sure I get that best casting, then that's my intent. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I, I, I realize I'm probably covering probably a little bit too much, but I know that a lot of you, as you're watching this video, are gonna come up with you know different questions, and I'm trying to cover things, um, be fair and be fairly systematic about. Well, actually, <laughs> if you've been watching any of my videos, I'm, I'm probably a little bit less than systematic. Um, it's more of a, a stream of consciousness as I'm talking and, and trying to present the information to you. Um, so I appreciate you guys being patient with that. But one one way or the other, as you if you as you I'm sure you have found is that I do get the information out to you. Um, you just need to be patient with that aspect of it. If you guys are really interested in, in, in really the full layout of my kiln, um, I can do a more specific video on my burnout kiln and, and really kind of more of the subtleties um, of it. Um, and you can leave you know, comments um, down below um, if you want me to, if, if you're interested in that kind of video. Okay, so as mentioned, when I originally you know, sprued, these, sprued up the skull and everything, I put a, and made my cups for my process, I put cardboard on top of the cups to keep the uh, slurry from flowing into it. So this is maintained as a hollow cavity. So ultimately I need to trim off the top of the, open up this cardboard and trim it off um, and open it up. Now the one thing, you know, people might do if they are, you know, with the lids and everything, um, they'll want to cut the cups off you know, literally like opening it up and going around the circumference of the top of, you know, the, off, the, off the top of the cup. Um, what I've found is that, uh, in particular because I use square cardboard to create myself a little bit more of a footprint uh, so these things will balance, I actually want to be able to take advantage of that so they'll also balance 
um, where they were first balancing on the drying rack in the shell room. Now I need them to balance in the center of, of the burnout kiln. And so I want to maintain as much of that surface area as possible um, so it's just easier for them to balance. So what I'm, I'm going to do is actually use the cutoff wheel on my grinder and slice off just the edge of the cardboard until I reveal the waxy cardboard underneath and then spin it around, make another cut, spin it around until I hit all four sides. And then I'm going to use this, I use a, a, a little pry bar or a, an old screwdriver and uh, plunge it into that, that wax division between the, you know, the, uh, the, the ceramic shell. And I can, with just a little bit of pressure, I can pop off that lid, opening up the, opening up the cup. And when we look inside, it already looks bone white, but we need to remember that the, co in the core of my cups is actually uh, styrofoam cups, which I dip in wax. And if you wanna see more about how I actually make my cups, and the reasoning behind that, uh, you can check, I'll have a, a link in the, video, or in the description below that talks about how I make my perfect uh, cups. Okay, so now that we have the, now that we've you know, sliced it open and popped off the wax lid off of our cups, you can see how they're nice and exposed. We can still see the styrofoam inside. Now the reasoning for the styrofoam is that I want, again, I want the, everything about the cup and everything about the spruce system to evacuate as quickly as possible so I can get my pattern wax out before it cracks the main shell. And I found that with the styrofoam inside, it's gonna, it just vaporizes. And then the, the thin skin of wax that I have on it that allowed me to weld my spruce to it, um, it again, it's also thin enough that, you know, it just it takes a lot less time. Um, I have been in situations where I've used, you know, cast wax cups. Um, and even if you're, you know, your cups are like, you know, eighth inch or three sixteenths inch, um, five millimeters uh, thick, um, that takes some time and some energy to actually get that cup out of the way before jumping in and, and actually allowing your pattern wax out. Now you'll see some people going in with a torch beforehand and really gutting out their cups um, to open up that space before getting them into the kiln. And if that, depending on if that's how you made your cup, then, you know, so be it. Um, but for me, I found that this is, you know, the, one of the more, more efficient ways of doing it. Um, yes, there might be some complaints about, oh, you're burning styrofoam. Well, I'm burning petroleum wax. And so, um, in general and stuff like that, so what little bit of extra, you know, fumes that are, you know, hitting the atmosphere from this one styrofoam cup compared to everything else that I'm doing in my process, um, it's, it's extremely minor. Now that I have everything lit, I'm going to go ahead and shut the door. It's just kind of friction fit. And so now we're going to, I'm going to let the kiln preheat and it, it'll probably come up at the temperature, I don't know, probably about 10 minutes. Like I said, I want to um, basically preheat my, uh, the castable that forms the bottom of my kiln. And then once I you know, get it up to a nice, you know, about 1400 degrees typically, then I'm going to put the, start putting the shells in. Okay, so one thing I kind of glazed over a little bit while we're, you know, waiting for the kiln to come up in temperature. Um, I kind of glazed over the idea of, you know, uh, any issues with safety. You'll notice that I did use, you know, put a respirator on before uh, cutting off the tops of the cups. And obviously, you're using a, a, a grinder or the cutoff wheel on a grinder. It produced a good bit, a, a nice big cloud of uh, silica. And so obviously you don't want to be breathing that in, super nasty. You know, if you can, you can put a fan next to you to kind of blow shit down, downwind. Um, but realistically, you know, when in doubt, have a respirator on. Now the fumes are going to come off the burnout kiln itself. Ideally you wear a, a respirator for that as well. I mean, if you're outdoors and it's, you know, you know, nice and breezy, it's not too bad. But like I said, when in doubt, it's always best to actually have um, the, the appropriate safety gear. Um, and whether that be safety glasses, respirators, um, gloves and whatnot. And speaking of that, let me grab my gloves. Now, realistically, as far as gloves go, um, obviously just standard welding gloves, you know, are, are fine for, you know, welding and, and touching things that are, you know, maybe a couple hundred degrees. Um, but realistically, you know, you're going to, you know, these things are going to shrink to your hands, if not outright catch on fire, if you're grabbing a, um, hot shells that are potentially, you know, 1600 degrees. You know, when we open up the, uh, this kiln and, we, and we're, it's time to pull things out, either you need a, a set of, you know, long handled tongs or something where you can grab a hold of something or the shell and to get it out of the mold. Um, the other thing, which is what I prefer to use, 
um, are these heavy, heavy mitts, and more than just oven mitts, uh, but uh, actually kiln mitts. It's a heavy, a lot of times, a heavy Kevlar uh, material, and there are different um, layerings and whatnot. Um, this one actually has a stainless steel mesh on it, and so that allow, creates an extra uh, vapor barrier um, and also holds up to the, um, the abrasiveness of the ceramic shell. If you wind up actually just using uh, standard Kevlar mitts uh, to pull out your shells, um, when they're that hot, it'll actually break down your gloves uh, pretty quickly after you know a dozen or two um, uh, uses and whatnot. So the, the stainless cloth actually winds up holding up pretty well. And so with this configuration of glove, I can actually touch objects up to about 2,500 degrees in temperature for, for, for at least a short period of time. And I like using the mitts because it allows me to, depending on whatever the shape is of my shells, so, you know, large, small, funky, you know, crazy shapes and all that, it allows me to be able to get the, the most firm grip on things and to get them in and out of the kiln without breaking them. Sometimes even when you go in, you use, you know, tongs or grips, it, it, it's easy to lose track of like how much pressure you're using to capture your shells and it's really easy to break your shells that way unless you have a really nice touch to it so anyway but to get around that these heavier mitts are a nice way to go look at my temperature I'm at about 1405 so I'm going to cut the burner into the main chamber and I want to do this fairly quickly, so I'm going to open up my door, set this first shell in, getting it to balance kind of in front of the burner. You can see that wax, wax igniting pretty quickly. Go ahead and get, shut this up and reignite the burner. Yeah, so now you can start seeing the wax dripping out already. I created some wings on the side of my angle iron to create a little bit bigger target. And then it just drains right down here to the trough and draining into the cake pan where I can collect it without being crazily you know, full of water and whatnot. And dropping things into water, you know, but you know, by having it come down this trough, I'm getting it out of the way, out of that heat source off the bottom of the kiln. So here we are. You can see there's you know a couple of random drips coming out, but that was actually I, I guess I, I need to time the next one. But maybe I don't know four minutes, maybe five, no more than five minutes, and all the wax is already dumped out of that piece. And so now we're going to bring it up to temperature. So I'm about 1400 degrees. And I'm going to bring that up to about 1600. So again, if I was doing a bunch of shells, I could get away with pulling it out pretty much now and flopping in the next shell. In this situation, I'm going to you know, bring it up to about 1600 degrees uh, to vitrify my shell. And then I'll swap out for the next piece. Now there's a little bit of smoke and vapor coming off the bottom of the kiln. But the stuff that's actually going up the flue through the afterburner and up out of the top of the kiln is actually almost smoke free at the moment. Realistically as it gets you know deeper into the burnout I'm expecting some flames eventually to come out the top there, but 
things are relatively under control. Now, because things are, this is my first burnout, I'm leaving the burner go. But even if I, but right now there's enough heat in there. It's about 1450 right now. But even if I turn off this burner, the burner you're hearing is from the afterburner, but just using the fan and the existing heat and fuel from the wax, the burnout is continuing. And it's a nice way to be able to kind of maintain and control things just so that everything just doesn't turn into a car fire. And then when things are under control, go ahead and just pop the gas back on. It reignites from the, the heat and the flames inherently in the chamber and fires back up. Okay, so we got the next shell in. Wax is already dripping out. And as we can see, things nice and nice and bright. No visible cracks. Although I'll take a closer inspection when it's cooled down. But we're looks like we're good to go. Uh, we got the shells burned out. Um, we have a nice bright color. All the carbon's burned off. So if we do have any anomalies, it'll be easier to you know to find out. Um, we can check for vitrification through pretty much by tone. You know, if, if it wound up, if there was kind of like a buzz or a rattle, that might be an indication of a, a crack. If it was a more of a thud color or a thud sound, um, it, it's an indication that there's still material inside the mold. Um, but again. We get a kind of a nice tone, a nice ring from it. Um, that's a good sign of vitrification and we're ready for the pour metal into these. This is the primary way I burn out the majority of my shells. I find this, you know, this way gives me, you know, maybe I don't save as, as much wax as I could from other processes, but it does give me high quality shells. I very rarely get cracks unless I'm just doing something crazy and it gives me the best cost things possible. If you, so anyway, so if you have any questions about this process, as always, you know, please leave comments below. If you're, you know, got something helpful from this video, hit the like button. If you're digging the content, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. And then until then, be creative and be safe.